How's it going everyone? Data here and welcome back to the Vancouver Canucks franchise mode here on NHL 24. Episode number six headed into the second half of year number two, the 2024-25 regular season. In the last one, we were cruising quite well on pace for 48 wins. Kuzmenko, Miller, Hughes and Pedersen all on pace for point per game plus this season. Reinhardt in his first season with us here in Vancouver has 34 points. Brock Besser, Philip Dano, other players on that second line in that middle six, not quite doing what they did last year, but still pulling their weight. Great surprise from Atu Ratu here in his rookie season. He made the team out of camp and he has 18 points in 41 games on pace for 36 so far this year. A lot of positives, including possibly the biggest positive, Thatcher Demko, who's currently 15, 12, and 1 on the year with four shutouts, a 927 save percentage, and 2.2 goals against average. So when we left off at the halfway point, we were doing quite well. We are in the top 10 of the NHL. We're third in our division. But honestly, of all the episodes so far in this series, aside from the introduction episode, this may have been the one where the assistant general managers had the most to say because our depth has been atrocious. As we can see, as we start scrolling down, we'll see Niels Hoaglander so far on the season, averaging 13 and a half minutes per night, shooting at 2.4% two goals in 41 games this season, despite having this even more, two more minutes of ice time than last season. One goal came on the power play and one goal came when he was filling in for Dano on the second line. So he has zero goals through, I would say like 38 games as a third liner. So that's been a big, big problem. But Colson, we don't expect as much from him. Seven goals though in 12 points on pace for 24, more of a physical penalty killing kind of guy. Three of his goals are game winners as well. But just to say, but Colson, who we expect less from, is doing way better than Hoaglander uh, when you put all that into perspective. Hannafin in his first season in Vancouver, holding it down, doing well. Susie Willander in his rookie season also. And then if we scroll a bit further down, we get the real uh, the real issues, I guess you could say. Studnika, 5 points, negative 14. Travis Boyd, 3 points, negative 16. Then you have Steele, Di Giuseppe, who have played some games as well, also negatives in that bottom, uh, on the fourth line, actually. Max La Joie, our seventh defenseman, two games, negative three with two minor penalties, not impressing us either. So definitely some things to fix headed into the second half of the season because we have an incredible top six right now. The top six, even just really the first line, firing on all cylinders. The first unit power play has been great. The plus five in that first line is really giving us a lot. JT Miller, who scored 60 points last season, is on pace for, what, 46, 92 this year, quick math. So really happy with the top six, but we're not going to be able to be a contending team if we have to rely always on the top guys and we have no depth to support them. So in this episode, we're thinking about a, a, a complete overhaul of the fourth line, as well as some changes to the third line to really support the bottom six in general some two-way forwards some grinders we went through the trade blocks last episode we thought about all the potential scenarios and i think i have an idea of what we're going to try and do heading into the second half of the season there were some suggestions saying for example philip dano should come down to be third line center because aturatu is a centerman but he has 62 face-offs they've grown from 60 to 62 but he still has a 39.62 face-off percentage which doesn't really cut it if we're going to be needing him to play such big minutes i know they're not huge but 11 15 per night full-time third liner we gotta have someone a bit more reliable on the dot so putting a on the uh, on the wing essentially wouldn't be a bad idea but then that means who plays third line center you could go Dano, then reinhardt comes to the second line center because he is center eligible 77 face-offs as well then maybe we bump up holden there to see if he can get something going but that would mean messing with a very good thing the top six has been amazing so you'd ask yourself why would you really change anything so we have to find some sort of middle ground that gets Ratu to the wing which also gets Hoaglander jump started a little bit before we give up on him and also just overhauls that fourth line so our work is cut out for us we definitely have some ideas so let's turn to the assistant general managers and see what they had to say in the last one I'm gonna go ahead and start it off with Matt who left a comment saying new to the channel enjoying the series quite a bit so far keep up the good work Matt thank you so very much and welcome to the AGM booth that fourth line is a nightmare and something needs to be done 
done. My first thought is to patch it up with a call up or two of anyone in the minors who's age 27 plus so that you're not stunting potential development too much. Alternatively, you could try searching for grinders, which is something you skipped over at the end. Good point. We looked at two way forwards, but not grinders. Having a line of grinders on the fourth line tends to be a net positive. Even one grinder centering the line with a high faceoff skill would make a difference. One other thought I have is to search for lower overall centers that are cheap to obtain, but have high faceoff and skating or physical abilities. A cheap two way forward could fit there. So, Matt, thank you for those thoughts. The grinders are actually pretty rare in NHL. There's not that many grinders, especially ones that we could afford and fit our criteria. But if we go to player search, I was doing a little bit of pre-scouting here, and we look around the NHL, all forwards who are listed as grinders, let's say the overall is 79 to 81, and we go ahead and search, there's only five grinders who pop up. Two, well, one that pops up is Tra uh, Tanner Jeannot, who we had pinned from the beginning of the series, but another one is Garnet Hathaway. So first things first, when I look at what kind of money they're making, Barkley Goodrow for 3.64 for three more years, you definitely cannot afford him. But when I look at all the other four other grinders, they are all in expiring deals. When I look at their defensive attributes, that's where things get a little deeper. And Jeannot has a lot of penalty minutes, man, as a grinder. 83, 83, 86, when I'm looking at defensive awareness, shot blocking, and stick checking, in the bottom left corner. I look at Nathan Bastion, I see 83, 77, 86. Giovanni Smith, 82, 76, 88. Then Hathaway, 83, 91, 91. So Hathaway really stands out on a bad Flyers team. He's not on the block, but he's on a losing Flyers team. Five-star physical, three-and-a-half-star defense. He would be a great fit, in my opinion, for that fourth line. So we'll keep Hathaway in mind as one potential piece for the fourth line. Let's see what the other age GMs had to say. So we'll hop over to Addy's comment. Legend, I won't go through the whole comment, but Addy says essentially, look at Alex Kerfoot and Sammy Blay. Now in the Discord server, we dived into this a little bit deeper. Kerfoot's plus minus has not been impressive. He's not looking that good for his overall and for the cost that he would be, but Sammy Blay does. The only thing is he's on a winning Buffalo Sabres team. So not much to say about this comment. Thank you for leaving it, Addy. But I just wanted to highlight how these were two more suggestions, but we went over them in the Discord server server and they likely won't work for right right now. Checking out some other names that were suggested, let's hop over to Cheating Heel's comment who said that JT Miller is not helping his case to boot him off the team. Cheating Heel was thinking that JT Miller could be one way to free up 8 million, but on that 92 point pace, I don't know. The plus minus on the second line has been quite an improvement this season, but that fourth line is quite atrocious. I love that word. Having negative 14 and negative 16 players with such low ice time is quite damaging and something has to be done there. I think that Studnika still has his spot, but I'd look into trading Boyd for someone with higher defensive attributes. Di Giuseppe can be replaced by someone from the AHL, maybe even Sheldon uh, Dries, who we can check the defensive attributes on in a moment. I would have expected a bit more production from Hoaglander and Pitkolzin, but hey, we're in a very good position, so it's hard to complain. We saw Hoaglander produce a bit more when he got second line time due to Deno's injury, so if someone else gets injured, we know that he can step up and produce a bit more. That's also true. When given the better opportunities, he does produce more but just to say two more minutes of ice time than last season and he's shooting at 2.4 percent that's crazy man Demko was our other weak link for part of last season so he looks to have put his poor playoff performance behind him and he's quite good so far there's really not much to improve on maybe we look at tweaking the power play a bit and most definitely improve that fourth line so it makes sense that top six even the top nine we could leave but the fourth line we've got to do something on top of what I had said about trying to get Ratu to the wing so we'll get back to that I really want to keep Kuzmenko and Reinhardt. Now we're talking about the contract extensions, but does that mean that we move on from either Miller or one of Dano or Besser? That's a tough one. So Cheating Heel giving some thoughts on who might move out there and more about how moving out Dano would probably work. But in my opinion, I would think that Matt Wah is probably the guy who leaves next year. I love Matt Wah, but if Tom Willinder is going to be a top four defenseman, that would bump him down to the third pair. We're not going to pay over four million to Matt Wah if that's going to be what's happening. So I would think Matt Wah is the guy that we move out next offseason to free up some money, but we can come back to that during the offseason. It probably comes down to Willinger's growth, so we'll have to keep note on that. The team's doing well, so this might be something we want to push the offseason, but my concern is that if we wait until the offseason to extend Kuzmenko and Reinhardt, what happens if their demands go higher? So I would say let's extend one of them in this episode, and we'll leave the other one for later on. 
Now, some targets for our fourth line that are on the trade block would include Gergensen, Robinson, Lewis, Maroon, who was a big pain last postseason, Jost, and Nick Foligno. As for defense, we might look at improving on La Joie, and I wouldn't mind taking a run at Robert Haig. Great start of the season. Let's make a couple of tweaks and cross our fingers. Go Nux. So thank you for all that cheating heel. A couple of those suggestions really stand out to me, aside from the contract stuff that we'll get to later on, just in terms of player acquisition. I gotta say that's Pat Maroon. If Hathaway could be right wing and Maroon on the left wing, that would be something. Maroon, one year, 1 million, 79 overall. Only played one game this season with Minnesota. He's getting just healthy scratched. He has the 85 points. You see how that translates as he scored a goal and two assists for three points in five games. He was a plus four last postseason for Minnesota. Cheating Heel had said that he was a pain for us last postseason. I forgot to mention, that's actually for the San Francisco Starfleet franchise mode as San Francisco faced Minnesota in round number one. So it looks like in not just this, franchise mode series but the other franchise mode series. it looks like Patrick Maroon had a good 2024 postseason so Maroon could be a guy that could help us longer term plus he does have that 88 stick checking he has the physicality he has the postseason experience the four and a half star physical Pat Maroon could be a good pickup for us from the wild plus as I mentioned he's a healthy scratch right now the wild aren't using him we don't need to try and make anything that's crazy unrealistic same for Hag over on Vegas he's currently playing down in the AHL despite being a 79 overall 88 shot blocking 86 stick checking He's on the trade block in Vegas, another good one. I had done a player search. I did some pre-scouting looking at which defenseman would fit our mold. Guys who are 79 or 80 overall who have a certain stick checking and shot blocking and all that. It came down to Hag and Danny DeKaiser. Danny DK DeKaiser, Donkey Kong. We know him well from a couple franchise mode series prior. He's also a 79 overall with that three and a half star defense. So DeKaiser could be a good option, but the Avalanche are one of the better teams in the NHL. I would assume that they would want to keep him in their system for depth. Meanwhile, Hag and like two or three other 78, 79 overalls are all buried in the AHL. Vegas has too many defensemen. So I would think our targets may be Hathaway, Hag and Maroon. Some other uh, pinned players here and watchlisted players are from our last few episodes. But I would think those three players could be big targets with guys like Boyd and uh, Max Lajoie moving out, along with likely some prospects, low prospects and low picks. One player that I really, really like, but the trade value might be too much, is mentioned in JJ Canyon's comment here. JJ says, good start to the season. Even with the depth lacking, I don't mind the lineup right now. I think a third line scorer could do this team wonders. I would specifically target a center. Like we said, Ratu, his face-off percentage not good enough. Maybe Adam Henrique. The, and we'll look at Adam Henrique in a moment. There are three players I would look to move out. First would be Hoaglander, who's just not cutting it. Uh, secondly would be Matt Hua, who I think we are planning on moving on from in the in the offseason. And third would be Silovs, as uh, the Smith wants a cheap extension. We'll try to extend him today. Silovs, again, good to have him just in the background in case we need a third goalie. So probably another offseason move, but I don't disagree with that, JJ. The one thing I would look at for the power play is moving Hironic down to power play two and bringing up a forward, probably Besser. Willander doesn't need power play time yet as he isn't putting up a lot of points, but it's more because of his ice time that he's there. The power play isn't really working, but a Pedersen, Miller, Reinhardt, Besser, Hughes power play should be awesome. I would even consider double shifting Pedersen or Hughes on the power play. Have a good one, Data. Thank you very much, JJ. So, good point there. And I keep saying Willander. It's Willander. Oh my goodness, I'll never get this right. Willander, Willander, Willander. So, on the power play, I decided to do something crazy. Hoaglander, I don't think he's moving up to the top six right now unless there's some sort of injury. So, Hoaglander, this is your last chance, buddy. Last season, he saw second unit power play and scored five points in 82 games. This year, he has five points in 41 games, so he seems to be doing okay on the power play. Let's throw him on the first unit, see if playing with higher talent will help him out. Then on that second unit, Hironic can be that guy who's the playmaker, the distributor, as opposed to having to share the role with Hughes. So Hironic and Willander can play the, the top here on the second unit. Besser would be tempting to bring over to the first unit, but then that second unit would be pretty bare. Besser's like the guy. Reinhardt is also solid here on that second unit. It's not like he doesn't score at all, but he is more of a playmaker. So we need someone who can really be that finisher and that's Brock Besser. So I don't want to move all my finishers to the first unit. That's kind of my thinking. So we'll see if Hoaglander playing on the first unit power play helps him out a little bit. It really will be his last chance because the leash is getting shorter and shorter. But those are my thoughts on that. Trying to quickly go through a couple more comments. Mighty Joe Maple saying it's been a season and we're only halfway through and we've got some work to do. Sam Steele's performance, or should I say the absence of it, is deeply concerning, so we'll make some changes there. Speaking of the bottom six as a whole, yikes, we need a little shake up. Maybe Hoagland 
Lindner or Podkolzin goes to the fourth line for a week or two, and maybe getting Ratu on a power play would work as well. So Hoaglinder, this is your last chance, buddy. Ratu is waiting for that power play spot. You gotta show me something, no matter where you are in the five on five. As for DeSmith, we'll definitely get that extension done for him, and we'll try to you know save as much space as po possible for uh, Reinhardt and Kuzmenko. Otherwise, we're looking good and seem to be headed for the postseason for the second time in as many years with our new management. Can't wait for the next one. Let's go Nux. Thank you, Mr. Maple. As I said at the beginning, a lot of other really good comments in this one, but I'll close it out with Pat. As I've been doing the last couple episodes, I think, our resident Canucks expert. Great stuff as always, Data. Pedersen at high franchise potential is wonderful. Yeah, that was a big thing from last episode, as is most of the team performance thus far. Studnika and Boyd have to go. I consider Adam Henrique or Josh Bailey and calling up Aman or Oman, excuse me, to replace them. I'm not worried about Holinder yet. That shooting percentage will rise. He's probably one of the most unlucky players players in the league. I agree for that. Please extend to Smith on that team-friendly deal and don't dare touch the top six or defense until the offseason. Everything there is looking great. Susie and Au Revoir will probably have to go after the season, unfortunately. Can't wait for the next one. Thank you for all that, Pat. So as I said earlier, I really do like that Adam Henrique suggestion from both Pat and JJ. And he is on the block over in St. Louis, but the thing is, the Blues know what they have. Adam Henrique has a lot of trade value, despite being an expiring contract at 34 years of age, or sorry, uh, one more year after this one, because through 43 games this season, he has 39 points. He's on pace to do something, you know, he's on pace to have over 60 points as a 34-year-old who has been scoring 20, 30, 40 the last few years. Hasn't even gotten close to numbers like 60, really, in his career. So Adam Henrique is firing on all cylinders. Despite the Blues, and he's playing a lot of ice time, despite the Blues not being being the most contending of contenders, and they are seller status, I wouldn't mind getting him. They do have a winning record, and they do have a great player who they will want to get good value from if they trade him away. For me to offer like Travis Boyd and a third and a random prospect, it wouldn't work. I would have to throw in Hoaglander to make this deal even get close. So although we're really tempted to look at a third line center like Adam Henrique, I don't think we can afford a player like that at this time. Ratu, the goal is to get him to the wing, but I think for right now, we wanna make some of those depth moves. I don't know why I exited the trade screen, and let's start making them. So first up would be Pat Maroon. He's on the block here in Minnesota. He's not being used. He played one game all season. I think Pat Maroon would be a very nice addition to the squad with the postseason experience that he brings. I don't want to trade back Sam Steele because we just got him from Minnesota. And I don't want to trade Travis Boyd because they don't want him. I think Philadelphia wanted him if I remember correctly. So it would probably be some sort of other minor type move. If I keep scrolling down here, you know, players that we probably wouldn't ever see making it out of the AHL type of thing. So Lajoie will save. Actually, no, Lajoie should probably move now because uh, Vegas won't want to take back another defenseman. So Lajoie for Maroon, that might be enough to just happen straight up. I don't think I'm going to offer anything else. I'm not going to try to get a pick back or anything. Can we do this straight up, Minnesota? Lajoie for Maroon, trade accepted. Beautiful! Pat Maroon, welcome to Vancouver, my friend. Max Lajoie off to be depth for the Minnesota Wild. One for one, bing, bang, bong. Now we move forward to the Flyers and we see that they do want Travis Boyd, which is good, but they don't necessarily want to move Garnet Hathaway, so we'll have to make it worth their while. Travis Boyd will slot into their lineup. They do save money on moving out Garnet Hathaway. So that would put us over the tr the, uh, the salary cap, unfortunately. That means we got to move somebody out. Maybe giving them Sam Steele makes it worth their while, getting a nice younger player in the system. Could I take back someone like League Minimum who could be a depth forward? So I need someone making like 900k or less here for the forwards for the Flyers who, let's see, sorting by overall. Uh, Cutter, yeah, of course not Cutter Gozi. It could be Kylock Pozo. We could get Kylock Pozo. That wouldn't be horrible. And then it goes down to the 77s after, like Dino Yi. We could get him medium top nine, but I don't think they'd want to move him. So I suppose we could get Kylock Pozo just as a veteran type of thing. We'd be over the salary cap by $9,000, but the game will let us do it. Can I get some sort of late pick as well? Like, Sam Steele doesn't have a lot of value, but I would think, you know, can I get a second, a, a sixth, excuse me, from you? Travis Boyd and Sam Steele, he still has medium top six potential. For Hathaway, Ocpozo, and a sixth, they would do this. Can I get a fifth? 
This will be the max. I will not try to squeeze anything more. Fifth, they will. All right, fifth round pick, bang. We believe this transaction will contribute to our success here in Philadelphia, so we're accepting your trade offer. Thank you very much. So Sam Steele, Travis Boyd, bye bye Steele wasn't horrible. He was a negative, like, what, five in 12 games, which comparatively wasn't as bad as the rest of the squad, but he wasn't helping. We weren't going to re-sign him. Let's move him out. We get Garnet Hathaway and his defense on this team. That's a huge plus. Now, let's play around with the uh, roster moves. We have to send down Di Giuseppe or I guess Ocpozo. I guess Di Giuseppe would be the guy that I'd be less worried about losing. Negative seven, three points in 32 games. So Di Giuseppe will send him down through waivers. Let's see, he makes it through. All right, very good. Now for our last move of the moment, let's go over to Vegas. They're a winning team, so it makes sense they wouldn't want to trade one of their actual roster de rostered uh, defensemen, but they have such defensive depth that they're willing to move guys who are in that 79, whatever, 80 overall range. Robert Hag is one of those guys. So if we can get him from Vegas as seventh D, that would be a big plus for us. Can I give you a depth forward? Can I interest you in someone like that? Because you won't want defensemen. Uh, could I flip Kyle Ocpozo maybe? Maybe make it into like a three-team type of thing. I flip Kyle Ocpozo and even a pick even because I got that fifth. Now I flip a sixth to you. How about that? Kyle Ocpozo and a sixth for Robert Hag and a seventh in 2026. Let's go crazy. What do you say about this, Vegas? Still not quite anything. Let's just do straight up then. Uh, yeah, let's just do it. Trade accept. I'm not going to look at Gibbs Horse in the mouth. Blah, blah, blah. I, I add a seventh. No way. We are not interested. I take away the seventh. Whoa. I hope you know what you're doing. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So Kyle Pozo, actually, I would have liked to keep him, but we're going to go ahead and flip him for Robert Hag since we do have enough forwards to say that we could survive without him. Dries, Giuseppe, whoever else. We don't necessarily need Ocpozo, but having no seventh defenseman, that's what we did need. So I'll go ahead and fix up the lines with those new additions. Then we'll take care of the extensions. Then we'll get simulating. I just wanted to note that we'll keep Josh Bailey in mind going towards the deadline. I really liked him right now, but the Bruins are a buyer team. Despite them having around a 500 record, they're a buyer team with a good depth piece in Josh Bailey. He has 12 points and is a plus 6 through 42 games, and he would fit our bottom 6, which is great, but the Bruins don't seem to be selling right now. So we'll keep an eye on him as we move towards the trade deadline. He could be a great piece if we're still having trouble in the bottom 6. So, the lines have been fixed up. They're not too much to really touch upon, really. It's just that 4 fourth line. Sunika will remain as fourth line center for now. Maroon on the left and Hathaway on the right. Maroon has a decent or actually a good fit on the fourth line. Sunika does as well and so does Hathaway. It's more just the, the uh, player types. Power forward, two-way forward, grinder is not you know necessarily giving a boost to the chemistry. But it is a zero and Hathaway on the penalty kill does fit very well. I took Sunika off and I put Reinhardt center. Hathaway with Reinhardt on the third unit does give a plus two so that is great. So Di Giuseppe down to the AHL. We'll have the forwards look like this. Robert Haig is there as 7th D and we'll get a forward up once Casey DeSmith is back and Silovs can be sent back down. DeSmith is out for another month, I believe, due to injury. So that being said, the lineup set. Now let's just look at the extensions quickly here. We could also think about Hathaway, Hag, all those guys as well. Hathaway would be wanting over 2 million. We can't afford that. Hag would be wanting 1.8 million. Can't afford that. And Maroon would be wanting 1.15. Maybe, maybe. But for now, when we think about next season, we have 12.948 million to play with. I think that's before the salary cap goes up, so it might be a little bit more than that. Kuzmenko wants 6 by 9.175, and Reinhardt wants 6 by 8.9. Although Kuzmenko wants more, he is the one who I would think would go up the most between now and the end of the season. I don't think Reinhardt's demand would really change very much, but Kuzmenko is tied for the, lead, the uh, team lead in points. He led the team in points last season. It's expensive, but it probably won't get any cheaper, and it could very well get more expensive. So if we can only extend one right now before we make other moves in the offseason, I think Kuzmenko is the guy. Six years at 9.175, 85% is about 7.8 million. Like if Elias Pettersson's at 9.5 and, and JT Miller is at 8, of course signed at different times when the salary cap was at a different amount, I think he'd probably be wanting something like 6 by 8 as well. 
Maybe we make it 7.950 just to say, so we can save 50,000. But I think that would be the amount he's looking for. 7.8, although that's not low, it kind of feels a bit lower than 7.95, almost 8 million. So Kuzmenko, he's had a solid couple of very, very good seasons. He was making five and a half. Now he's going to make two and a half million more for the next couple seasons. I think it's a fair amount that balances a bit of a somewhat-ish discount at the same time saying, hey, I got to get paid. So six by 7.95. Let's see what Kuzmenko says about that. He'll be our only extension that we're well, actually only big extension we have to look at Casey DeSmith as well because Casey DeSmith last time we saw wanted a really cheap deal 83 overall who yes is 33 but he wants 875k close to league minimum he's loving his time here in Vancouver he even wants it for two years so I would say don't need to cheap out and go to 800k let's go two years at 900k I guess on Casey DeSmith he's happy to be here he's getting into his final few seasons so two years 900k to lock himself in as a backup on a good team I think that makes sense for a guy of his you know position I suppose so two years at 900k on Casey to Smith and six years at 7.95 on Andre Kuzmenko so let's advance a day does anything change in one day no so here we go on the road against the Winnipeg Jets last uh, in the in the first half we were 24 16 and 1 we are on pace to go 48 32 and 2 let's hope for a little bit of improvement from the power play and the penalty kill as keep in mind even though we're seventh in the NHL our power play currently sits at 17 0.7%, which is closer to being really in the middle, smack dab in the middle pretty much of the NHL. But our penalty kill is at 85.7, which is seventh best in the league, which is the same as us being seventh best in the NHL overall. So hopefully those special teams can continue to be on the uh, upward trend. So here in Winnipeg for game one of the second half of year number two here with the Canucks, we are at Canada Life Center with Maroon and with uh, Garnet Hathaway in our lineup. Let's see if it gives us a little bit more stability on that fourth line and hopefully soon for the third line if we can play around with Atu Ratu and you know still a lot to figure out but for now I like those two big changes. First period 2-1 Jets early. Hoaglander there he is! Niels Hoaglander the man of the hour the man who's been in all of these conversations scores his third goal of the season there it is. Silovs is in tonight as there's a back-to-back -back and Demko's getting some rest he allows two goals on 12 shots we're down 2-1 after 20. Second period 2-2 Pat Maroon there he is in his first First game as a Canuck, we love to see it. Negative 14s and 16s on that fourth line. Maroon scores in his first game as a Canuck. Let's go. 2-2 two -two after 40. Even if we don't win, Kyle, Kyle Connor scores the second of the ninth. Even if we don't win, Hoaglander and Maroon scoring our two goals, that's big. Now, can the top six come in a little bit? Or Because if not, then it'll be 3-0 right now. Power play for the Jets. Extended opportunity here late in the third. We kill it off. Three minutes to go. Momentum back in our favor. We're getting a lot of shots on net. Final minute and that'll be all she wrote three to the final shots and 36 to 34 but Hellebuck was too good for us and uh, Kyle Connor scored a couple goals as well so 3-2 win for the Jets in regulation but good to see Hoaglander and Maroon now let's advance a couple of days do we get answers from Kuzmenko and or DeSmith yes we do easy decision for Kuzmenko lovely and great news from Casey DeSmith so two more question marks taken care of for next season but definitely gonna be tough for the rest of the contracts because Sam Reinhardt is going to have to be dealing with 5.773 million and he wants 8.9. So, and that's just Sam Reinhardt. So it will be a tough offseason ahead, but for now, we are doing the best we can and we'll want to take a run for it while we have the opportunity to do so. So back in Vancouver now at Rogers Arena hosting the San Jose Sharks. Let's see what we do for Maroon and Hathaway's first home game as Canucks. Maroon scoring in his debut. Hathaway, the spotlight's on you, buddy. First period, 2 nothing Sharks, Eklund and uh, Cunnan. Second period, 2 one Willander, all right, power play goal from that second unit on Montambo. Shots are 31 to 22, but of course, 79 overall Montambo is going to make miracles. Down by one here in the third period. Come on, let's tie this up. We're getting a lot of shots, and thank you, Studnika, the fourth line, and then JT Miller up on that first line. Love it. From down 2 1 to up 3 2, power play Sharks kill off, power play Canucks kill off as well. We're in the 40s now in the shots, and Pedersen, thank you very much, extends our lead to two. A little bit of insurance in the later stages of the third period. Final minute, and that's all she wrote.
thank you, as Miller, uh, Blake Wheeler scores with 37 seconds left. Shots end 42-32, to and we win 4-3 the final, with Miller scoring goal and an assist, and Hironik and Kuzmenko both getting two assists apiece. All right, so I love how we're looking to start things off. The fourth line seems to be doing okay for now. Let's get into some calendar simulation. No team in particular that really jumps out at me. Maybe the Flyers, Hathaway versus Steele and Boyd. Let's go see that. Let's just do some simulation. 4-1 win against the Avalanche. 6-3 win against the Kraken. Then we lose 4-2 against the Jets. Possibly still off between the pipes once again. Uh, hosting the Canadians, 3-2 win. Hosting the Blues, 6-2 loss. On the road against the Capitals, 2-1 win. And then a 3-1 win at Madison Square Garden for a win number 30 on the season. Now in Philadelphia to face the 22, 23, and 3 Flyers. Hathaway against Steele and Boyd. Let's do it. Wells Fargo Center. First period, 1-1. Kuzmenko and Forster. Uh, shots doubled for the Flyers, 18-9. Second period, 2-1. Connect me on the power play. We come back in the shots, 27-24 to now for the Flyers. But we're down by one here in the third period. Can we get that top six going? And there's Philip Hironik. Thank you very much. That top pair D coming through to tie this game up against the sub-500 Flyers. we got to get these wins. Come on now. It's going to be tight in the metro in the, uh, in the Pacific Division, thinking like, I'm, like we're the Flyers again. We're now with five minutes to go. We're still being outshot, but it's a tight 2-2 score line with a minute left in the third. We're headed to overtime shots and 40-33 to for the Flyers. But it's time for three-on-three -three action here in Philly. Final minute of overtime. Nothing. Off to the shootout. And in the end, we take it. Sam Reinhardt gets the lone winner. 42 to 39 the shots in the end for Philly, but we come away with the victory in the shootout. Demko makes 40 saves. Our potential Vesna candidate carrying when he has to do so. You love to see it. That'll bring us very close to the all-star break now. We'll go through uh, Buffalo. Yeah, let's go. Let's sim through Buffalo. And then we'll go watch the first game after the break as we face Buffalo again. A 30-win team. We faced them twice. Ooh, big 6-5 win. Uh, injury down in the AHL. Big 6-5 win in Buffalo. Uh, we can best... Uh, no, I'll take care of that in the AHL. All right, back to it. And we're through the all-star break. 32-19-1 is our record. We're now hosting the Sabres after we beat them 6-5 in Buffalo. Now we host them. They are 30-17-2, one of the top teams in the Eastern Conference for sure. First period, 2-1 Sabres. Thompson opens it up, then Cousins adds on. But Patrick Maroon makes it a 2-1 game. We're being outshot 16-6. Marc-Andre Fleur between the pipes for the for Sabres. How about that? Second period, 3-2 goal apiece there. JT Miller ties it up, but then Tage Thompson gets his second. Shots are 30-20 to 20 for the Sabres. We're down by one. Power play Buffalo. And Tage Thompson completes the hat trick just as the power play expires. And that is a 4-2 Sabres lead now. Power play for, this, for the uh, Canucks. And Kuzmenko brings us back within one. Thank you very much. Halfway through the third period, being outshot close to double. Power play Canucks, though, killed off by the Sabres. But then JT Miller scores even strength. Outshot 42-29, to but we're tied at four. Into the final two minutes of this one against two of the top teams in the NHL. And we're off to overtime. Shots 44-31 to for the Sabres through 60. Three on three action. And the Canucks win it with her. Ronick ending at 30 seconds in. Shots end 45 to 32, but we come away with the victory. How about that? Thompson has the hat trick, but Kuzmenko a goal and two assists. JT Miller, two goals, and that's a great victory for your Vancouver Canucks. Let's keep on simulating now. No game in particular. Let's just get a couple of weeks done or so. Casey Smith should be back soon. 5-1 win on the road against the Kraken. Back to the calendar. 4-2 win against the Blues. On the road against the Hurricanes, 5-3 win. I'm not sure what the score was against the Blue Jackets, but Casey DeSmith is now back in the lineup. Let's see what did uh, Silovs do. Uh, are those, yeah, yeah, two games, two appearances, two losses, 873 save percentage, 4.38 goals against average, eesh. Uh, not waiver eligible, fantastic. So Silovs will go back to the AHL, and DeSmith will come back to his rightful spot. Let me just make those moves. All right, DeSmith is back. It was a 2 nothing shutout. How about that for, for uh, Thatcher Demko against the Blue Jackets and a 5-2 loss on the road against the Bruins. All right, so 37-20-1 is our record at the moment. Let's keep on going towards the Maple Leafs. All right, they're a very good team in the Eastern Conference. On the road in Tampa, we win 5-4 on the road. Against the Senators, we win 5-4 again, but this time in the shootout. Looking for a win number 40, hosting the 35-19-4 Toronto Maple Leafs. Let's do it and get 40 right here at 
at home. First period, 1-0 Toronto. Austin Matthews on the power play. Second period, 1-1 Elias Pettersson. Thank you very much. Shots 27-14 to in our favor headed into the third. Power play Canucks killed off. And it's a power play goal from John Tavares there. But then JT Miller answers right back four seconds later. But then Austin Matthews 30 seconds after that, or 29 seconds. And then Nick Foligno makes it a 4-2 game. We're out shooting them 31-20 to and we're down 5-2. to Demko falling apart in this one. Power play Canucks late. Now let's just call it there. Yikes. 5 through the final as Quinn Hughes added 1. We outshot them 38-22, to but we don't get win number 40 there, unfortunately. Uh, Juleson always gets injured, this guy. Let's keep on going towards the trade deadline. One more game against the Panthers before we'll pause, take a quick look at how things are going. No, thank you, San Jose. And it's a 5-2 loss at home. Lovely. 39, 22, and 1 is the record. So at the deadline, checking out the standings through 62 games, we're still third in the Pacific Division, and we are now fourth in the NHL. So three of the top four teams in the NHL coming from the Pacific. So at least that's good to know. We're fourth in the NHL. Power play has increased to 19.8%. Good, eighth in the league. And Pony Kill has gone down a little bit to 84% which is more in the top, what, like 13, 14? All right, okay, or top 12 even, I wasn't really counting, but still good to see that we're up there for the, the special teams, despite the penalty kill going down a little bit. JT Miller, 72 points through 62 games right now. Kuzmenko at 70 with 33 goals. Pedersen, 66. Hughes at 66, woo! Reinhardt, Besser, Hronik. What do we wanna just check in on? Let's see, Ratu at 22. He's up to an 80 overall. His face-offs are up to 63. I don't know, I'd, like to, I'd prefer to get him onto the wing. Hoaglander woke up a little bit, shooting at 4% now. <laughs> he has 5 goals and 21 points at the moment. Put Coles in. Hathaway. So Garnet Hathaway, let's check out the fourth line. Hathaway has 2 goals, 2 assists, 4 points, and an even plus minus. That's like unheard of for our fourth line this season. That was negative 14, negative 16. So even plus minus through 21 games. Well done to Garnet Hathaway. Uh, then we see Studnika's negative 16 has gone down 1 to negative 17, hasn't really changed. And Patty Maroon, let's see him, 5 goals, 6 points, a plus 1 through 21 games. So really, that's all we were asking from them, and they're coming through right now. So that's good to see. And goaltending, Demko is still a wall back there. 920 save percentage, 2.5 goals against average. Last couple games have maybe roughed him up a little bit. But yeah, I'm not discontent with anything here. I'm pretty happy with how most of the team is going, although it is especially reliant on our top line with the plus five. But when I think about potential trades that might happen and where that player would go, Hoaglander's picking it up a little bit, but Colson's doing what he has to do. Ratu, I'd love to see him on the wing, like I said, but this is really the best spot for him right now, most likely. Studnika could give the third line a plus two, but then I don't want to take Ratu off that third line, unless we did, and then put him on the power play, but I don't know, Hoaglander seems to be doing well in the power play. Eight power play points, yeah, I don't know. I think things are going well enough. It's, you know, it's always that that temptation to say we should do something because we are trying to make a push at the during the postseason, saying that we should do something at the deadline. But we do have a good 7th D ready to go. We do have good options down in the AHL in Dries, Di Giuseppe, uh, Oman, uh, 378 overalls who could slot up if need be. I don't know if it's worth trading a 7th round pick who could become a low elite prospect just to say, hey, we made a move. As always, I'll do my due diligence and check the trade blocks around the NHL. But I can't really say that I think a move will happen. All right, so around the NHL, some names do interest me, but it's just too difficult with the money that's going around. Like you got like guys like Joe Pavelski on the block making eight million. You got Tarasenko on the block making nine million. Some players that would be great, but we just don't have the money. Other players that are signed beyond one year. Other players that have inflated trade value, like Adam Henrique. The one player who I would look at getting if it were to work would be Frank Vitrano. He has the best mix of. Uh, ability plus the trade value not being too high. Vitrano is an 83 overall who would fit potentially our bottom six. He has 30 points in 64 games, 83 overall, two way forward. He wouldn't be a bad fit for the third line, I don't think. But we'd need the Ducks to retain 950k, which is almost impossible. And we don't really have much to trade either. Here's a couple prospects, Jet Wu and Ulrich Sin. Like, what would Anaheim say to this? They're not even interested. It bears no semblance to the trade block. So I'd have to dig into the trade block a little bit. I'd have to use one of our rookies. Our, the one guy that maybe we could use could be Kudryavtsev. He is a former seventh round pick, 69 overall. 
medium top six D. He could become something, but like, I don't know, like, would Anaheim be interested in this at all? See, this they would do if there was no salary retained, but we can't afford to not have any salary retained. We can't trade out any money. So it, it just won't work. I don't want to include draft picks. We have a first, a second, a fourth, and two fifths in this draft. I don't want to include anything. So Frank Vitrano would be the closest one to working, but we just don't really have the trade value. So I kept this in the episode so I could showcase that to you. I did do my due diligence. I did try to make it work, but the money is way too tight. The moves we did at the beginning will have to be enough to get us through. And thankfully, it has brought us to a solid record. So we'll sim through the deadline and see what the rest of the NHL did. Let's check it out. So Adam Henrique ended up going to the Hurricanes, and you see it makes a lot more sense. The Blues got Nybeck and Panomarev. What was I going to give uh, that medium top six prospect and a fourth? Like It made a lot more sense that the Blues capitalized on Henrique's value and traded him to the Hurricanes for a couple prospects. Dante Fabro and a sixth going to the Minnesota Wild. Uh, some picks and various prospect swaps here. Ivan Provorov going to the Coyotes. Rosean and Kozak, Kozak going to the Sharks. Pacioretty to the Sabres. Zuccarello to the Blue Jackets, Severson to the Wild, Roslovic to the Sabres, Yuri Kulich and Olivier Nadeau going to the Panthers in that Roslovic uh, swap. Interesting. All right, so there are the trades around the NHL as we head into the final stretch here. Let's check out this game against the Blackhawks, our rivals so far in this series. They're 35, 25, and 2, 8, 2, and 0 in their last 10. We're 39, 22, and 1, and 7, 3, and 0 in our last 10. We want win number 40, and it'll be a great time to do it here in Chicago against a team that eliminated us last season. Let's go. First period, 2-1 Blackhawks. Hall opens it up. Kuzmenko ties it. Then Connor Bedard, 34 seconds later, put the Blackhawks back up. Second period, 2-2. Two -two. Quinn Hughes on the power play on anti Ranta. Thank you very much. Shots are 24-20. And now JT Miller, first shot of the third, puts us up 3-2. But then Reichel scores shorthanded. Power play Canucks. And then Kuzmenko gets it back. All right on the power play. We're up by one. Power play for the Blackhawks here in the third. We kill that off. We're leading the shots through the halfway point of the third period. It's a one goal game, thanks to our goals from our top dogs here. Final five minutes of the third with a slim margin. Canucks are holding on tight with the Blackhawks pushing, but we hang on for the 4-3 victory. Shots end tied at 31. Kuzmenko, two goals and an assist. Miller, goal and two assists. There they are, fighting for who's gonna lead the team in points. You love to see it. And that gets us win number 40. So we're in the final stretch, ladies and gentlemen. Let's just sim a good chunk. Not really going to any game in particular. Let's just do it. Max Lajoie on waivers. There he is. Decline. No thank you. On the road against the Flames, 5-2 loss. Then the Sharks, 6-4 loss. At a couple days later, 5-4 win. 3-2 loss against the Kings. 7-3 loss. Whoa, 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 whoa. Pump the brakes. Whoa, 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 whoa. We win a nice game against the Blackhawks, get win number 40. Then we go on a nice little stretch where we lose, what, four out of five? Or five out of six, actually, with our only win coming in the shootout. Woo. So one, five, and oh in our last six games after that win against the Blackhawks. That's wild. And then we win five to two at least against the, the Jets, get back into it. But that is not what we want to be seeing. Maybe I'll give the benefit of the doubt here. We got a victory against the Jets and we lose three to one. Against the top team in the NHL, I believe now the Oilers that are looking for who are looking for win number 50. Let's see if we can stop them here at home. Let's get back into it. The slow sim seems to be our friend so far. First period, nothing. Second period, 2-2. Two -two. Ryan and McDavid for the Oilers. Besser and Petkolzin for us. Very nice. Oilers leading in shots by a little bit. Power play Canucks. And there's Brock Besser with his second to put us up 3-2. to two. Let's call it a game here. Let's try to get through it. 4-3 the final. Nuge ties it up on the power play. But Hoaglander gets the winner. 4-3 Canucks the final. Let's get through this end of the season. Come on now. Hoaglander and Petkolzin scoring the same game. You love to see it. Alvin Dirksen fired by the Canadians. That name is not French enough, so there you go. We keep the Oilers from winning, win, from getting win number 50 in Vancouver. Now, can we keep them from getting win number 50 back in Edmonton a few days later? After a 4-3 win, they will be hungry, or a 4-3 loss, the Oilers will be hungry to get that win. First period, 2-1 Oilers. Dano opens it up. We haven't seen him in a while. McDavid then scores in the power play, and Nuge shorthanded. Come on now. Second period, 3-1 Evander Kane. We're down by two here in the third period. Power play Oilers early, and there you have it. Whoa! The Canucks stand up for themselves. My apologies. That is my bad. At 4-1, I said, let's call it, but Willander gets a power play goal. Besser and then Hannafin with a minute and a half to go. We're off to overtime. 4-4 game from down 4-1. to one. Do we have magic in 3-on-3 three -three overtime? Not quite. We are off to the shootout where the Oilers take it for win number 50, but we do get that extra point with a huge third period surge. Well, 
well done. I was ready to throw in the towel. Well done. So the Oilers get win number 50. We continue to fight here in the Pacific Division. Let's move towards the end of the season against the LA Kings. No reason to stop now. Let's keep on going. Uh, broken foot in the AHL. That's not good. On the road against the Coyotes. 4-3 loss in the shootout. 5-4 loss in the shootout the next night. AHL injuries are coming left and right. 2-1 loss. 5-4 shootout loss. Whoa. What's going on with this end of the season little, uh, what, I don't know what to call it. Maybe it would be a good time to do some experimentation in the last four games or something here. 44, 29, and 5. They have a great record, but I'm not impressed with how things are going over here. Ratu's up to an 81 overall. That's great. He's at 30 points. How is that uh, face-off percentage looking? 41.61 now. We never ended up getting him on that wing. It's unfortunate. Hopefully they're negative 4. Put Cole's negative 3. Okay. What's up here? Whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Ben voyons. Negative 8! This fourth line is a black hole! Eight points, negative eight, and 37 games from Garnet Hathaway. Bang, come on now. Studenica's a negative 26! Negative 26, come on! And Pat Maroon, what's up with you, buddy? Negative six, 10 points, negative six from Pat Maroon. Uh, we gotta, yeah, we, are, we gotta use these games to experiment a little bit. The defense, everyone's a plus here. Negative six, negative two on that last pair, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, we could switch things around a little bit, but I think the defense, I don't think that's our problem. DeSmith, 896 save percentage, even Demko. See, we can't rely on the goaltenders to always be superheroes. Let's give Hag a little ice time. Susie, you have the worst plus minus? Yeah, let's get Susie out for like four games or whatever's left in the season. Let's get Hag in the lineup here with Willander. He fits best on the second pair, but we'll keep him on the third with Willander. Let's see how Robert Hag does there. And on offense, I'm going to call somebody up to play fourth line center. Now the question is, who is it? Sheldon Drees, who's a sniper? Maybe not. Klimovich, do we get him to get a chance here? Second round pick in 2021. Oman is injured now. It's a playable injury though, so he's back. You know what? Let's, let's call him up. Yeah, let's do it. Let's call up Oman, who has the playable injury. And we'll see how that goes. Because that's just ridiculous now. That fourth line is really upsetting me. I don't know what to say. It, is it the coach? I don't know. I don't know. So Oman will play with Maroon and Hathaway. Sudnika out. And Hag will play on the third D pair as well, just to give him a little bit of a trial headed into the postseason. Uh, I'd be tempted to even try something like Hoaglander moving up. What if we do try what we had said about Phil Deneau? What if we do try that? So Dano comes down, Reinhardt to the wing, Ratu to the wing here, and Hoaglander comes up. Let's try that. So let's keep these numbers in mind. Nine goals, 19 assists, negative four for Hoaglander. And for Ratu here on the wing, 14 goals, 16 assists, negative one. Let's try that and see what happens. Dano, he's also a plus 12. We'll keep an eye on his plus minus. All right, let's get the last few games of the season done. We we're a horrible beyond regulation recently. We had only one overtime and shootout loss in the first half of the season. Now we have, what, four in our last 10 games? So let's get the first couple here, the Ducks and the Sharks in Anaheim. Oman, thank you, fully healed. In Anaheim, we win 5-4, to four, then we lose 2-0, get shut out by the Sharks. Now we're going to be our final home game of the season here against the Kraken. Technically, we're on a worse pace than the start of the year because we were going to we were on pace to win 48. Now the max we can win is 47. First period here for our last home game of the season. Beniers scores twice on DeSmith. Kuzmenko gets one. Second period, 4-4. All right, Kuzmenko gets another. Nosek, Olofsson, but then put Colson scores twice on his new third line with Dano. 4-4 after 40. We shouldn't be this tight with a team like the Kraken. Let's see us separate ourselves a little bit here. Top six i'm looking at you there's quinn hughes all right on the top pair on spencer knight five four for the canucks one goal lead into the final five minutes or so leading in the shots by a slim margin as well hanging on tight we'll take any win we can get but this one was too tight my friends shots end tied at 33 and we win five to four thanks to the captain getting us the winner two goals from colson and kuzmenko 5-4 the final to get us win number 46. Now the last game of the season here will be on the road against the LA Kings, who are 34, 40, and 7. Let's use it to get momentum back in our favor. Let's get a little bit of boost and a little hop in our step headed into the playoffs. First period, 1-0, Patty Maroon. Second period, 2-1, Ratu scores, all right, and Pearson gets one back on the LA Kings. Shots 24-19 in our favor through 40 minutes. We're up by one, another slim margin. Power play for the... A couple power plays 
there for the the uh, LA Kings that are killed off. Very well done. And then Gavrikov scores even strength. The Smith playing again over here. Why is he playing in back to back nights? Power play Kings once more. Thankfully, we kill off again. We're tied. And then Kuzmenko puts us ahead late. Could that be enough to end it on a dub? And yes, it is. Andre Kuzmenko gets the winning goal late. Shots end 34 to 31, and we win 3 2 the final. The Smith makes 29 saves, and Kuzmenko gets a huge game winning goal to end our season, ladies and gentlemen, with a record of 47. 30 and 5. We were on pace to lose 32, so we lost less in regulation, but we did not win as many as we should have because of those overtime or mostly shootout losses. Way too many shootout losses that could have gotten us even to 50 wins. So, did everyone in the NHL play their 82nd game? Not quite yet. I didn't really keep an eye on the postseason hunt because I thought we were really locked in, but it was getting a bit tighter than it should have been just because of how good the Pacific Division is. But in the end, we finish 6th best in the NHL with 99 points, 47, 30, and 5 being the record. Washington had horrible luck beyond regulation. Oh my goodness. 3.28 goals for and 2.93 goals against. The power play ended at 20.6%. Very good. 5th best, 6th best in the NHL. If you look at the penalty kill, ooh, yeah. Penalty kill needs to be touched up. Uh, up uh, heading into the postseason down to 82.1 I think the rest of the league dropped a little bit as well we're still kind of in the middle but it should not be at 82.1 uh, our last 10 4 2 and 4 in our last 10 what a way to end the year Looking at the points now, who came away with it? Kuzmenko led the way in the end. 88 points from Kuzmenko to once again lead the team in points. JT Miller right behind him with a huge bounce back 87 point season. Next year, I'm going to increase the injuries a little bit more. They were 12 on 100, then I put them to 13 on 100. I'm not saying I want injuries, but there were not enough to make things realistic in my opinion this year. Way too many players playing 82 games. Pedersen also 81 points. Nice little bounce back from what? Seven, well, bounce back. He had 77 last year, but good to see from our highest overall player. Quinn Hughes, 78 points. That's the Quinn Hughes we know and love after he scored just 56 last year. Big year from the captain, possibly a Norris Trophy. Sam Reinhardt in his first season with us gets 65 points. That's what we brought him in for. Brock Besser, 52. Hronik, 46. Another big year from him. Phil Dano takes a bit of a step back with a 41-point season after he scored 56 last year. His ice time didn't really dip, no, so I'm not super impressed. Only five power play points. Playing the entire season the entire season as on the center of the second power play unit. And he gets five power play points. That's crazy to me. Ratu, they, the Mr. Uh, Mr. Pace. Mr. Pace, 36 points. He was on pace at the, at the 20 game mark. He was on pace at the 41 game mark. And he ends exactly with those 36 points that he was on pace to do. Well done. And looking back at where he was at the 78 game mark when we switched him to the wing, he had 14 goals and 16 assists and was a negative one. So that means that he scored six points and was a plus four in those four games. Ooh, keep note of that. Hoaglander ends with 29 points. When we had seen him at the 78 game mark, he had nine goals, 19 assists, negative four. So Hoaglander on the second line had one assist and was a negative two in four games. So Ratu on the wing of the third line works, but Hoaglander on the wing of the second did not seem to. But Colson ends with 27 points, a solid enough year from him. Garnet Hathaway in the end, 10 points, negative seven through 41 games. I guess that's not horrible when you think about what the alternatives were with Travis Boyd and uh, Sam Steele and all those other guys, but still. Hannafin, his first season here, 22 points plus six. Willander's rookie season ends as a 19-point year. Very nicely done. Susie, 16 points, negative six. Matt Waugh, 14 and a plus eight. Sudnika ends with 13 points and negative 26, as we know. Pat Maroon ends with eight goals and 11 points with a negative five through 41 games on the fourth line. And Hag, two assists? What? And a plus two. Maybe he should start the postseason. That's a question for us to keep in mind. Even Oman, one assist and a plus one. All right, all right. Uh, Goaltending now. So Demko, he did come back down to earth a little bit. He ends 35, 22, and 4 with five shutouts, 915 save percentage, and 2.69 goals against average. In EA land, still great numbers, but definitely not the like 928 save percentage that we were seeing before. DeSmith also ends 12, 8, and 1 with two shutouts, but despite having two shutouts, an 898 save percentage and 3.17 goals against average. So not as impressive, I have to say. Looking at the entire NHL, Leon Dreisaitl led the league with 100. 
111 points. If we look at the defense in the league, Quinn Hughes second in scoring. Hamilton also had the better plus minus, so you would think Dougie Hamilton likely wins the Norris, but Quinn Hughes was right there, even with Kale McCarr. So Hamilton, Hughes, McCarr, the top three, and Hughes is right there in there. Good to see. And for goalies in the NHL, uh, Demko not really up there for the wins either, right? 35 ish so if we put let's say minimum whatever 30 games played and we sort by save percentage you know 915 isn't bad actually but still not the league leading numbers that we were seeing before and same for 2.69 goals against average actually third so you know what it makes me feel a little bit better actually about Demko but just too bad that he couldn't maintain those crazy numbers and looking at rookies in the NHL, Will Smith with 60 points led the league. Ratu down here with 36. He's still in the mix of some of the better rookies in the NHL. So hats off to you, my friend. Lane Hudson, 51 points on the Canadians. Sheesh. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There is the scoring around the NHL. In the AHL, we currently sit 30, 35, and 3. Yikes. So likely no, no, well, definitely no uh, postseason there in the AHL. Let's just advance a couple more days so we can see who we're going to be facing in round number one of the postseason before we wrap it up with our final questions. In round number one of year number two, we will be facing the Vegas Golden Knights. Wow, this will not be easy. Vegas, who ended 49, 24, and 9. The second best team in the NHL. That's wild. So teams number two and six face off in round number one. That's crazy. That's yeah, the two division teams, I guess, but still, the Pacific was just so strong. Wow, that is not going to be an easy first round matchup. Wow, that really, uh, that really shocked me. Yikes. Let's check out the Vegas Golden Knights lineup. They were one win shy of 50. They were the second best team in the NHL for a reason, that's for sure. Marchessault, Eichel, and Niederreiter on that first line. Roy, Stevenson, and Barbashev on the second. Carrier, Carlson, Okpozo, of course, Kyle Okpozo. And Dan Forth, Stastny, and Denisenko on the fourth. Defense, they have Theodore and Petrangelo, crazy top pair. White Cloud, Haig, Martinez, and McNabb. Uh, interesting, Nicholas, this is like Haig? Our guy is Haig? 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 Really, uh... Just the semantics, I suppose. And Robin Leonard between the pipes, backed up by Aiden Hill. Robin Leonard, what did he do this season? 914 save percentage. Yeah. All right. And scratches. Uh, ah, it's even with Mark Stone injured. This is their lineup even with Mark Stone injured. Sheesh. Mark Stone, of course, injury-prone kind of guy. He actually dr fell probably relatively early in the season then. I bet he started healthy. So he had seven goals and nine assists in 20 games. He had 16 points. How long is he out for? Let's see here. Still pending evaluation. It can't be. Unless he was injured and then he came back and he got re-injured. I don't know. But Mark Stone seemingly will be out for, I would think, at least the first round. So that does help us. But it seems like Vegas is doing very well without him. So, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. A strong second half that saw us win 47 games in the end. But still, a lot of areas of concern, I have to say. A lot of areas of concern. So we made some interesting changes in the final four games. Let me know what you think about how we should look going into the postseason. I would think Ho uh, Hoaglander would have to leave the second line, but I really want Ratu to stay on the wing. He seems to thrive without having to be the center on the line. Oman also did better in the small sample size than Studnika was doing, so I think we keep the fourth line how it's been. Even on defense, Robert Hag here playing with Wall uh, Will uh, Willinder, my goodness, got two assists and was a plus two. So I would think the defense stays the same as well, but we got to think about the middle six, I would think. The middle six will likely see changes. So let me know your thoughts on the lineup headed into the postseason. Even the power play, the penalty kill, we got to think about that as well. Remember that unit number one looks like this. Unit number two looks like this. And when it comes to the penalty kill, unit number one, unit number two, and unit number three. So definitely some changes to be made headed into the postseason. It won't be easy facing the second best team in the NHL, but I think we're up for it, ladies and gentlemen. After having lost in round number one last year, we definitely want to enter this postseason with a vengeance. And I hope to see you there. So if you're excited, leave a like. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already for ongoing Vancouver Canucks franchise mode. Our San Francisco Starfleet expansion franchise mode series which is live every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern here on the YouTube channel. Breaking news and analysis in the real world of hockey. A little bit more happening here and there. I know it's not quite trade deadline season yet but Patty Kane signing with the Red Wings and stuff like that of course making waves in the NHL. So subscribe if you haven't already so it's to be made aware of all of those uploads. Leave 
all your thoughts down here on YouTube or over on the Discord server, link in the description, so that you can have your suggestions integrated into the 2025 postseason. It's not going to be easy, but I think we can do it if we all come together and pool our thoughts as the collective, as the assistant general managers here on the channel. So thank you once again for taking the time to watch. I'm looking forward to seeing you once again in the next one as we look to make our first legitimate push for a Stanley Cup.